Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Uma Mishra Newberry. I am the Volunteer Executive Director of Women's March Global. Today, we are featuring another webinar in our partnership with Stand With Kashmir. With Stand With Kashmir. Since 13th of September 2019, Women's March Global and Stand With Kashmir have held webinars in an effort to share knowledge and educate people on the complexity and history of the conflict. The webinar series is a space for anyone who wants to learn about the ongoing situation in Kashmir, as well as the history leading up to present day Kashmir. In the past few months, we have discussed topics around why Kashmir is the most dangerous place on earth, how to survive in the world's most militarized zone, what daily life under occupation looks like, sexual warfare and what women in resistance in Kashmir looks like, and most recently, the place of Kashmir in Bollywood. Today's webinar, Detainees Across Borders, Kashmir, Palestine, and Guantanamo, is part of Stand With Kashmir's Release Kashmiri Prisoners Campaign. Kashmiris have been held in jails in, in Jammu and Kashmir and all over India before and in the aftermath of the events of the 5th of August, 2019, to include minors, women, those who are ill and the elderly. In addition to those who have been languishing in jails for years, for expressing their dissent to India's occupation. An estimated 4,000 to 13,000 people have been detained since the 5th of August. Stand With Kashmir calls for the immediate release of all Kashmiri prisoners. As part of this conversation, we wanted to hold a global dialogue around the situation of detainees across borders. So it is with deep gratitude that I now introduce our panelists for today's webinar. Habil Iqbal is a lawyer based in Kashmir who has worked on cases relating to human rights violations in Kashmir generally and on detainees in particular. Currently, he is practicing law in Kashmir and also working with the organization Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. Habil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Osama Moore. Osama was previously a steering member of the National Students for Justice in Palestine and is now an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. He is currently serving as a general coordinator of the Atlanta chapter in the state of Georgia. Osama, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you and thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Dr. Asim Qureshi is the research director of the advocacy group CAGE, who assists individuals detained and harmed under the global war on terror. He is the author of A Virtue of Disobedience and the forthcoming editor of I Refuse to Condemn, Resisting Racism in Times of National Security. Asim, thank you so much for joining us. I will ask each of the panelists to speak for around 15 minutes on their respective topics. After that, we will open the forum up for questions for our audience, both here and those who are following us on YouTube. So please post your questions as the discussion continues to progress and we will do our best to get to your questions at the end of the webinar. So Habil, I would like to start with you first, if you could talk to us about what, you, what your work is in your focus area. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Stand With Kashmir and Women's Global March uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, as you said, my name is Habil Iqbal. I'm based in Kashmir. Uh, I practice law and I mainly deal with cases of human rights violations that includes uh, cases relating to detainees, cases relating to enforced disappearances and uh, other human rights violations. And currently, I'm also working uh, with an organization that is Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. Uh, it is a collective of uh, victims of the members who have, whose uh, kids and kids have been forcibly disappeared uh, at the hands of state. So I have been uh, working with them also and uh, focusing on the law practice also. Uh, can am I audible? Yeah. So uh, uh, coming to the role of uh, the detentions uh, in maintaining the occupation, 
well i can say that uh, since 1947 the indian state uh, has systematically used the detentions and arbitrary arrests uh, that includes also the preventive detentions to politically uh, suppress the people of the jammu and kashmir from the last uh, 3 decades uh, kashmir has been one of the most militarized zones uh, of the world and we have seen that how the state uses laws to enforce its writ on the people of jammu and kashmir uh since 1947 there have been many uh, political prisoners who have been taken uh who have been taken to jails whose personal liberty has been snatched by the indian state and uh if we talk about uh, like 2008 2010 and 2016 and we saw unprecedented uh we saw unprecedented uh, arrests detentions and other uh, methods that include torture as well Uh, especially i would like to talk about uh, post august 5th 2019 when india deoperationalized the article 370 in jammu and kashmir and since then even according to the home ministry sources of indian government around 7 and a half thousand people were arrested in jammu and kashmir and around uh, 450 were detained under a law that's known as public safety act i'll come on to that later also and uh, that included minors also even the state also recognized that some of the minors were also detained under administrative detention uh these arrests have been broadly under acts such as public safety act unlawful activities prevention act and as i said we'll come to that uh, again so uh about the role these uh, detentions play in maintaining this occupation uh, i can safely say that we are living under a permanent state of exception here a state of emergency in which the indian state uses extraordinary laws to maintain to maintain sovereignty and it and it wants us to believe that it's for the good of the people that we are invoking such stringent and harsh laws so it's the the laws which these authorities uh, use it's these laws which legitimize their excesses in a way uh, we can say that we have legitimated excesses here uh, under the garb and under the color of these legislations the draconian measures are imposed on us it is these extraordinary measures which help the indian state control and dominate the people of jammu and kashmir uh i can say that uh, those uh, who hesitate to wallow in the pure uh, discourse of colonialism they it's they they hide behind the fig leaf of the law so for them law is the mask which they use to perpetuate their excesses so uh it's the mask which really muddies the water which uh, obfuscates which confuses and uh we can say it kind of uh, nauseates the perpetrator he kind of uh, gets an excuse so uh it it, it gives him that uh, sense that what he is doing uh, is right because it is legal so that's what uh, most of the people uh, in uh, india and also outside believe that what is happening in kashmir is not wrong because it is legal and why it's legal because it has the legal backing of laws because we have seen how the laws operate here so uh, that is one part that what role do these detentions play in maintaining the occupation and uh, now if i come to the part that uh, of a political prisoner who is a political prisoner and what are the demographics of these political prisoners who have been taken under arrest here uh, since i can say 1947 uh so as most of us may be knowing political prisoner is a one whose liberty has been deprived because of his political opinions he holds an ideology and that's for which he is either persecuted prosecuted convicted whose liberty can be 
deprived in many forms. It can be an arrest, it can be a detention, and uh, it can be torture also. We have seen how these, uh, you know, they, they work more or less in tandem with each other. So that's one part uh, of that, who is a political uh, prisoner. And we have to see here, what, what's the role of the legal structure? Because uh, once we say that somebody has been uh, prosecuted for his political opinions, that means we, we, are impu we are impugning that there is a political motivation. I, although the political motivation is a political concept, but it is the but it is the legal structure which makes it possible it is the legal structure which perpetuates it so that's how the legal and the political go hand to hand one supports the other and that's how they go so we have a political uh, prisoners here i would like to name a few uh, we have dr kasim faktu who has been in jail for the last 27 years and he has been uh, convicted under a law which was known as Terrorist and Disruptives Act. This act, uh, which was in vogue uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, it all it, it was a it was a very harsh law because it it could also uh, you 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 could also be convicted for a confession given to a police officer. It, it made it admissible that even if you are. Uh, giving any confession under any duress, it will be used against you. So he was convicted under this act. He is in jail for the last 27 years. But owing to the hue and cry, uh, this act has been repealed now. But he continues to be uh, languishing in jail for the last 27 years. And although this act has been repealed now, we are seeing uh, that Yasin Malik, who is a resistance leader of Jammu and Kashmir, who is facing a trial under this act now. And can you believe he is facing a trial after three decades now? So they are, uh, the Indian state is saying that you had killed some Indian Air Force personnel, but that was long three decades back. And he was here in the public gaze. So we can safely say that he is one more political prisoner who is languishing under jail uh, presently. And then uh, we can talk about Mia Abdul Qayyum. He is one of the topmost lawyers of Jammu and Kashmir, and he is the president of the High Court Bar Association. He was fighting the case of uh, victims of the human rights violations in court. And moreover, uh, at the time of his arrest, he was arguing uh, the case about the revocation, uh, sorry, about the assault on the art Article 370, its legality, in the court of law. So he was detained under Public Safety Act on 4th of August uh, 19, uh, that's last year. Uh, and uh, we have seen his dossier. The dossier says that you are an ideologue of secessionist ideology. You hold secessionist ideology. So here we have a state which on record goes to say that we have incarcerated you uh, in administrative detention for your that these are all uh, political prisoners. And then we have the case of Masrat Alam. Uh, he's another resistance leader. He has been under arrest. He has been intermittently under arrest uh, for 23 years since 1991. And he has been under administrative detention. Uh, that is, he's not facing a trial. And uh, the courts usually uh, don't uphold this law, don't uphold the uh, administrative detention order. But what the state does is it reimposes the Public Safety Act. So we have these revolving door detentions also. Uh, and then uh, we have somebody like the tallest and the most respected leader of Jammu and Kashmir, Sayyid Alisha Gilani. He is under an indefinite detention. He has been incarcerated in his home. He is in his 90s. And since 2010, he has been incarcerated in his home and he's not allowed to move outside. So they call it house arrest. And, and you won't find any formal orders for that. Uh, now I'll quickly come on to the demographics part. The, what are the demographics of these political prisoners? Uh, in my opinion, it will be safe to say that uh, cutting across all sections of the population, you will find the political prisoners here. 
and uh, in this context the indian state has arrested people uh, from all walks of life be that political leaders political activists human rights defenders journalists you name any body any uh, business leaders have also been arrested so this is uh, yeah and uh, uh, sorry i am running out of time i know that so the the legal apparatus we can talk about the legal apparatus in which these uh, prisoners so we have uh, laws like public safety act we have laws like uh, uh, unlawful activities prevention act we have laws like armed forces special powers act all these all these laws give impunity uh, to the state uh, in dealing with the prisoners uh, it's under these laws that uh, arrests have been made so uh, now we will quickly come on to the these recent cases of journalists who have been hounded using unlawful activities prevention act which is an act which is so broadly uh, uh, couched and it can you can be booked for anything uh, which they feel uh, can cause uh, disaffection against uh, the government and in my sense it is like tyranny in the name of national security and then uh, we they, these laws cannot hold on the principle of legality that's uh, the laws should be clear uh, that's one and uh, recently the human rights reporters they have also called on the state of jammu and kashmir to release political prisoners like uh, mia abdul qayyum and now uh, for example if we talk about the remedies what are the remedies here uh remedies are basically the courts you invoke the extraordinary uh, jurisdiction of the courts and you file a writ of habeas corpus but again it takes months together and then as soon as you are out you can be booked under a different under a different public safety act and uh the impact is huge it's on the families it's on the individuals it's on the community the the impact they want to create is to have uh, a reign of terror in our minds to 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 rule our minds and to have a deafening silence here so that's it thank you so very much havil i i know that for myself and so many of us that um you know this understanding of how laws are used against kashmiris is something that many people don't understand and you said um in your presentation law is the mask that they the the indian government uses to manage their access it gives the perpetrator the sense that what he is doing is right because it is legal um you know and that is that is the view that so many people outside of the situation have and continue to have um and the the unpacking of those com complexities cannot happen in 15 minutes so i appreciate that that you had to condense so much of that um but thank you thank you for for your discussion on this um we will definitely there's some questions that have come in for you and we will definitely ask those after we've had um the presentations from Asim and Osama as well so thank you um Osama i would like to turn to you now to um really uh shed some light on and i know that you have a presentation to share so i will turn it over to you is my um presentation yes okay is it full screen it is not full screen perfect okay so um yeah my name is Osama um I'm really glad to be here um and to talk about the um prisoner struggle in many different areas of the world um and and I'm looking forward to this discussion as we not only discuss detainee struggle uh, in different areas of the world but to link their struggles intellectually and practically um so thank you Habil also for your analysis of the um political prisoner conditions and draconian affairs in Kashmir um I will get started I first want to begin with a key point here that the political prisoner struggle uh in Palestine constitutes one of the most important elements of our struggle. Um the approach I take is one that attempts to emphasize the prisoner at least in the Palestinian context um as an agent of the national struggle. 
against the occupation. So it takes a you know maybe more historical approach um, that I hope may frame a little bit of our discussion in terms of how we support detainees in a new light. So our objectives will be to cover this idea of what a political prisoner is uh, within Palestine, the inception and development of the prisoner struggle, uh, and um, a lot of emphasis on the Palestinian prisoners movement. Um, so one thing to note really is that there isn't really a, univer a universal definition of what a, what, a, what a political prisoner is. There are very definitions, many institutions, many human rights institutions have kind of different parameters of what defines a political prisoner. But I would say, um, basically speaking, I would say that they basically constitute a category deemed by the state to be undesirables, people that are deemed to be a threat to state hegemony. Um, and usually refer to prisoners who have particularly waged struggle against the state to achieve certain political objectives. Um, in contrast to that, there's a prisoner of conscience where Amnesty International, for example, um, defines a prisoner of conscience to be somebody who has been jailed or had their freedom restricted because of their beliefs. Um, and most of the time, they are individuals who have not carried out acts of sabotage or acts of violence. Um, and the people who have advocated for violence cannot be deemed um, prisoners of conscience. So the difference here is that you will have the Amnesty International, for instance, and, and some other liberal institutions that will actually call for the release of prisoners of conscience, but are very careful to go beyond that and advocate for the release of political prisoners if they deem them to be too radical or too revolutionary. Um, and so with this designation, we have to recognize the inherent limitations of a liberal institution, a neoliberal institution to truly defend our national struggles. Um, as Habil was, was also discussing, administrative detention, uh, a term that covers the arrest and detention of individuals without charge or trial, usually for security in the Palestinian context, administrative detention was actually introduced via British law to subdue Palestinians during their revolts. So in this sense you have, and it was adopted by Zionist policy. So you have this sort of like colonial and imperial legacy um, very inherent, very blatant when we talk about the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And since 1967, we've had about over 50,000 administrative detention orders since. Um, and I am moving a little fast here for the sake of time, uh, primarily to get into the, the Palestinian prisoners movement. But, but in 1967, or since 1967, we have had over 800,000 Palestinians incarcerated um, following the six day war and the occupation of the Palestinian lands, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. That figure, 800,000, refers specifically to the West Bank and Gaza alone, so excluding East Jerusalem. Um, on top of this, on top of this, the Israeli legal system refuses to acknowledge or recognize Palestinian resistance as prisoners of war and consider them outside the regulations of war, describing them as terrorists. So as where some prisoner rights may apply to prisoners of war, um, they apply much less so, or there's, very, there's a lot fewer rights that can be applied to people that are deemed terrorists. With that said, the objectives of Israeli imprisonment of, uh, of, of a population mass imprisonment is to isolate and is to pacify. So it's to isolate Palestinian revolutionaries and dissidents from the rest of their society and, and through that process to pacify their nationalist aspirations. So since 1967, that's really been the, the sort of character of the uh, Israeli policy of mass imprisonment. And from this, you've had a response to the Israeli attempts. And that response is really manifested in the Palestinian prisoners movement. Um, so as the imperial and colonial prison is meant to disconnect the prisoners, disconnect its inmates by isolating them, in contrast, the inmates of the prison seek to communicate, seek to reconnect themselves to each other and to their society. And that's exactly what the um, sort of precursor to the prisoner movement did in Palestine is that we, we began to see organizing begin early in late 60s 
And some of the early actions they would take is simply utilize new tactics of communication. So for example, writing on cigarette papers, messages and passing them on to each other discreetly in, in, in defiance of the prison guard or writing in a, in a capsule or capsule, uh, writing again, a letter and kind of rolling it up, putting it in the capsule and passing it discreetly in order to again, communicate and transfer knowledge in defiance of the occupier and even going to the length of swallowing the capsule and then discharging it through their stool when they, when they go to another area of the prison. So that's the level at which they went to communicate and to build um, community. Democratic decision-making really characterized the kind of early process of organization we see in the early days of the Palestinian prisoners movement and I'll elaborate on that. Um, so the objective here also, or like the sub objective is the attempt, we're trying to get into the first intifada and to describe the experiences of the prisoners during the first intifada. So we're, so we're jumping, but to give a, uh, some political backdrop of this period, I feel like this context is important. Um, in 1982, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was expelled from Lebanon. And so uh, by the Israeli invasion of, of, of Lebanon. What that exile did was cause a shift um, of local leadership within the occupied territories to rely more on mass-based structures and less on armed struggle. So they're seeing the defeat of the representative body that was carrying out armed struggle. So you, you see the shift in work against the occupation. So what this looked like was mass-based structures, popular committees, unions, among every sector of the Palestinian people. The point here that I'm making by highlighting this backdrop and then getting into the this sort of shift in the mass based structures is to point out that the prisoner movement reflected the broad changes that was happening outside of the prison. So what I mean by that is, as you've had this shift away from armed struggle, you had more and more Palestinians be, and especially young Palestinian students be um, detained by the Israeli occupation based on mere affiliation with a group conducting resistance, uh, even nonviolent resistance against the occupation. So now we're having more and more younger students in the prisons at the same time. So we're having a diversification of the demographic. We are having a decentralization of the sort of um, hierarchy and, and the rules within the prison organization. So in this sense, we see this kind of link between the university as, and the prison as incubators for the Palestinian movement, producing new leaders over time. Um, so academia, and what I mean by that is the university was also a site in which Palestinians and Palestinian academics used academia as a way to resist against and their right to education to resist against occupation. Um, at this point, as we're leading up to the first Intifada, which was launched in 1987, we can say that the internal education programs, which is what the Palestinian prisoners movement was conducting, these programs were, you can say, schools of revolution. And what that means is, as a community, the Palestinian prisoners were organizing programs of education covering history, foreign languages, including Hebrew, political theory and more inside the prisons. A production of magazines written in notebooks featuring poetry, literary criticisms, political analysis. So in a sense, the, the, the um, Israeli prison became a major site of political organization. Um, that is instrumental to understanding why the, why the uh, prisoners movement was so easily able or not rather easily able, was in the position that it was to influence the first intifada and to influence what was going on, on in the Palestinian street. So the relationship of the prisoner movement to, this, to the street is summed up as this. The high level of organization and discipline that was produced in the prisoner movement served as a model for the popular committees going out on the outside, on the, on the streets. And also the growth of the popular committees outside empowered the PPM in that more and more through, through mass imprisonment of these young Palestinians, the Palestinian prisoner movement, and not just young Palestinians, all Palestinians, the Palestinian prisoner movement began to be reinforced. Um, 
So to know there was this empowering relationship between the outside and the inside of the formation of the of the committees on the outside with the with the Palestinian prisoners in the inside. And we also see that through this concept of sumud. And in the concept of sumud, meaning steadfastness in Arabic, to briefly describe it, um, it carries with it this meaning of enduring like the olive tree, right? Where this, the, the roots stretch deep into the land. So no matter what, resisting, enduring, staying on your land, despite the means um, um, institutionalized to remove you from the land. This characterized the mass structures that were happening on the streets, on the, the in the Palestinian villages, where um, they were people were 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 sort of had a political orientation that poverty, for instance, was not due to um, just it wasn't it didn't exist in a vacuum. It was caused, it was fomented, it was strengthened by the Israeli occupation. This concept of steadfastness and and, and identifying the root problems of every socioeconomic problem you can have from agriculture to prison to women to healthcare, women's rights to healthcare is, is kind of the foundation of Samud. So to describe Samud in the, in the prisoner context, just briefly, Samud within the prisons was the philosophy of how they struggle. What that means is that um, Samud as this, as this philosophy of steadfastness was institutionalized by the prisoners movement. The philosophy of confrontation behind the bars was one of the manuals that was actually produced by the prisoners with, with um, no author, no date of, of publication. People say that um, there is at least one copy of this manual in every Israeli prison set up for Palestinians, by Palestinians, where the book deals with the question of how the Palestinian activist uh, of what the Palestinian uh, activists arrested by the Israeli colonial authorities should do when they're being interrogated, right? And the philosophy of confrontation embodies and sort of regenerates also the Palestinian experience, but they also drew upon the experiences of other revolutionaries living in the world. Um, also, because my screen is full screen, if uh, you're giving me a warning that my time is running out, I can't tell. So if you could, uh, three minutes, okay. Um, and, and what the manual did was tell, you know, the Palestinian who was uh, newly in prison, in prison to remember the, the party, the political party, remember the neighborhood, remember your friends, remember your family. In the prison, the only body you, the only weapon you have is the body. And it is your tool to disrupt the colonial authority and, and the colonial relations. What is the manifestation of Sumud? What is the manifestation of the body as the weapon? It is the hunger strike. And in the Palestinian context, Palestinians have carried out hunger strikes continuously throughout the um, period since, 60, since 1967, demanding access to education, completing high school exams, university exams, proper medical care, and to solitary confinement, and so on. The hunger strike in Palestine carries enormous revolutionary potential in the sense that it actually causes Israel to become very anxious when this happens because of the, the possibility of it igniting popular rebellion. So in this way, we see how the prisons are able to inform, are able to get the outside to mobilize around the prisoner struggle. And due for the sake of time, I'm gonna to have to uh, kind of move through this very quickly, but um, Oslo, the Oslo Accords of 1993, there's a lot of background needed to understand Oslo, but I will reiterate that Oslo, the Oslo Accords, the peace process was really an instrument of Palestinian surrender. And in this case, we saw this sort of, um, you know, neoliberal focus on this idea of state development. And through state development, we saw the dissolution of mass-based structures, the same ones that supported the prisoners, they were crumbling. And so now you have this shift from a, from a, from a, from a framework of Somud, of steadfastness, of national liberation to a sort of legal liberal human rights framework. Um, and what I mean by that is sort of the kind of uh, maneuvering that we see Amnesty International did. And this is just to say that the struggle of the prisoner today is very dire. 
because of the dissolution of those mass case structures. Um, my last two slides here, I just want to mention the, the effect on families and public health in that mass imprisonment of Palestinian prisoners, um, they are typically, most often the Palestinian prisoners tend to be working age men, husbands, fathers, sons, um, who function as primary providers for their families. So this has obvious implications on, in terms of public health, in terms of how is the family supposed to sustain itself? Yeah. Um, and then also the psychosocial trauma amongst Palestinian children who are detained by the Israeli Defense Forces and are kidnapped in the middle of the night at like 3 a.m., sometimes going as young as six years old. Um, in sum, in sum, um, the Palestinian prisoner movement represents to the Palestinian national movement not simply a branch of injustice, not simply a statistic, not simply a component of one of the many crimes, uh, one of the many gross violations of international law and human rights that Israel conducts on a daily basis, but they represent to the movement, a movement of leaders in the movement where you've had Palestinian leaders run and win po positions in the Palestinian Legislative Council, um, where you've had prisoners mobilizing together, being able to supersede factionalization, where they orchestrate hunger strikes. All in all, um, what we have to remember is that when we talk about prisoners and we wanna mobilize around the question of the prisoner everywhere they are in the world is to remember their agency, remember them as leaders, remember that uh, at least in the Palestinian context, they're the compass of our struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Osama. I'm just going to, there we go, thank you. Um, and I, I know for everyone listening on YouTube and uh, for those who are in our webinar, it's so difficult for all of our presenters to unpack um, this topic in 15 minutes. Um, we, Osama, you brought up, um, I think something that really has struck a chord with, with people given what is coming in on, um, on the chat also in YouTube and also on Zoom in that people would have never thought of prisons as incubators for leaders. And you brought up the fact that the political prisoner struggle in Palestine constitutes one of the most important elements of the struggle itself. You also referenced um, at the very beginning of your talk, how we need to make the connection between what is happening in Kashmir to what is happening in Palestine and to what um, Asim you will talk about in Guantan Guantanamo as well. And I think if, for those of you who are listening, if you can think about what Habila said and what Osama just presented as well, and as Asim is, is presenting, the connections of what is being represented here, the, the challenges and the complexities that prisoners in Kashmir versus Palestine versus Guantanamo are all facing. Um, one of the questions that has been asked that um, I will definitely put to the panelists is what can be done from a global context um, to help uh, this, this political prisoner situation globally that we see. So thank you so much, Osama, for that presentation. I know that many people found that very, very um, instructive and useful. Um, Asim, I will turn to you um, to talk about the situation um, and your work, especially with CAGE um, in Guantanamo. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for, for taking the time to join us. Um, it's always quite difficult to uh, follow up after two very, very brilliant presentations, but I, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, do justice to theirs. Uh, my thanks to Stanford Kashmir, especially and the Women's Global March for, for inviting me. I do, I do appreciate the being given the platform to be able to speak about some of our work. So I guess I really want to start by saying that the war on terror as a construct, it globalizes so much of what we see in various national contexts uh, around the world. What what was taking place in Palestine and Kashmir and you know, in other, in varied contexts, we found kind of everywhere, all, of, all at once. So all nations bought into this narrative of um, an immediate need for national security legislation. They enacted that legislation 
and they allowed for a system of of pure hegemony of national security hegemony to prevail over the world and so when we when when osama and uh, habil were talking whenever they were referencing anything immediately my mind was going to different contexts whether it was guantanamo bay whether it was abu ghraib whether it was pre crime detention uh, in the UK or CVE in America, there were you will find the echoes of all of these. And of course, with Palestine and Kashmir, much longer issues, they have a much longer history. And one of the things we have to recognize is that they're all learning from one another in these moments of repression. And I think Angela Davis, she, she does a great job of explaining this when she says that in order to understand the militarization of the police in Ferguson, Missouri, you need to understand the militarization of um, the, the police in Gaza. That these things are inextricably linked to one another. We can't think about one without thinking about the other. And so in that regard, you know, because I think especially that Habila and Osama did such an amazing job talking about political detentions themselves, what I want to do is actually pick up on the last aspect of Os Osama's talk, which is really about what happens to all of those, those hidden places within these detentions, the ones that we don't necessarily um, privilege in the same way because they're almost seen as collateral damage. And I'm talking about here like the families um, and especially children. Uh, going back uh, a number of years, this is back to 2006, I remember interviewing the daughter of Saiful Aparacha, who's uh, one of the oldest uh, people in Guantanamo, who's in his 70s now. He, she, I was interviewing her and talking to her about her experiences, and she's describing me to this moment of um, being on the internet and reading all these things about what's ha she's mentioned specifically what's happening in Palestine. She's a young Pakistani girl sitting in Karachi, but looking about what's happening to the Palestinian people. And I think at that time, Lebanon had just been attacked by Israel. And she said that when I go into school the next day, my friends are all talking about the latest shawls, the latest designs, and I'm looking at them saying to them, what is wrong with you? There is real stuff going on in the world. You know, you know, why are you so focused on these superficial and material things? And then she says to me, and then I have to take a step back and realize that then nothing's wrong with them. I'm the one who's changed. I'm the one who's now, uh, you know, in this completely different universe than I'm supposed to be in. So I found that really fascinating because we, you know these these contexts these moments they have such huge meaning for for all for all people involved they, they are changed forever and not just by the person who's detained but really in every single aspect of their lives i remember being in nairobi in 2007 i interviewed a four-year-old hafsa saleh ali she had been detained in a Kenyan prison for 30 days alongside her mother because they suspected that her father was involved with terrorism. And, you know, Hafsa herself as a four-year-old was interrogated separately to, to her mother. And even after release, and I, I think I interviewed her maybe two months after her release, even after her release, she, whenever she saw a, a Kenyan man in a uniform, even if he was a cleaner on the street, she would soil herself because she would associate a uniform with her detention period. So the, the trauma that Hafsa went through was encoded in her body. It was no longer simply that the trauma was relegated to a moment in the past. These moments have significance beyond that. Again, um, in, back in Pakistan in Karachi, I was sitting at the, uh, the dining table of a family who the husband had been put through an enforced disappearance for, no, for a number of years. And my, my mind kept on getting, my, my, uh, my eyes kept on getting distracted by the daughter. She was on the table and she was doing something that I found very strange. She was feeding a picture at the dinner table and a picture, and I, when I turned the picture around, I really was, it was a picture of her father. And she was trying to retain a sense of meaning of what a relationship to her father might be by including him in this kind of dining experience at, at it's 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 dinner time it's breakfast time it's lunch time my father's here and i'm going to include him in this process of, of of dining with him so you know the the meaning that we take from from all of this it's so much bigger and grander than sometimes we 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 take for granted uh one of the guantanamo bay detainees um here in the uk shakar amir 
he was held in Guantanamo for 13 years. You know, he'll talk to you himself, you know, he, he talks about this quite a lot, that the hardest part wasn't the fact that he was in Guantanamo for those 13 years. It was the fact that his youngest child, he has four children, his youngest child was born while he was there, while he was detained. And when he came back, like the whole notion of having a relationship with his own child was just completely non-existent. Like we take for granted what it means to, to hug somebody in a way that has full emotion, that you, you feel this palpable sense of just pure unending love for this person in front of you. And, and those 13 years, they took that away from him. They, that, you know, that, just that pure feeling of, okay, I'm, 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 I'm hugging you with pure warmth and feeling that back. Those, those things you can't just get back. And, and that's why the trauma that we are need to study has to be simply beyond the prisoner themselves. We have to look at how meaning is, is taken in all these, these different circumstances. And of course, one of the, the concerns that we have, and a lot of these studies came out of, uh, in fact, the Holocaust, is this idea of intergenerational trauma, how those people who go through trauma within the study of epigenetics, we see that markers are left on future generations where the next generations, even two or three generations down the line, are, um, are more susceptible to hyperarousal. So when, they, when they're in that fight or flight situation, they're more susceptible to, to feeling like they need to run or they, that they're scared of something. You know, whereas our normality is probably not the same as theirs in terms of we're able to gauge fear better than they can. So that's important because, of course, you know, when we think about traumatized communities and how they then respond to their repression, they, those who, who have these, these histories and these trajectories of trauma are going to be more uh, affected in the way that they then respond to, they respond to the repression of state. And so actions that they might take you know, aren't necessarily just limited to that particular moment, but rather connected to a much longer and larger, larger history. But of course, like, you know, we, we, we think a lot about uh, prisoners. Um, and of course, within the pop context of, of, of Palestine Kashmir, these are nearly every single one of them is, is a political detention. But there is a whole category of individual of those who were detained, but never charged. So in different contexts around the world, the period of time for this can change. In the UK, you can be detained up to 28 days in pre-charge detention. Now, I was glad to, to see Osama speak about liberals, right? Because, you know, one of the things that liberals will tell us that, well, you know, the government wanted 90 days and we managed to get it down to 28. So that's a big win for all of us, right? You know, these things aren't wins because the people who are suffering the violence of these moments, for them, their life has changed forever. When you get raided, uh in in the uk there will be 60 police officers in 30 cars battering your door down you know many of them are muslims so their 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 wives are not in hijab their children are affected there is a whole spectacle of trauma then they're taken away from anywhere between 7 to 28 days and during that time even if it's seven days do you think that person's still going to have a job at the other end do you think that their life is ever going to be the same you know, I've heard so many times people who were arrested and never charged tell me that friends, family friends, that people had that had known them for 30, 40 years would come and they would say, please remove our phone number from your phone book. You know, we know that there's nothing against you. We know that you were released without charge, but we don't, we don't want our own children to be affected by these things. We don't want our families to be impacted the way that you were. So we're sorry, but you know, this is, this is the situation. And unfortunately, I've interviewed so many people who have been through circumstances that because the, because as, uh, as the others spoke about, the violence isn't just about uh, the individual. It is about sending a message to the whole community that we own, we have complete hegemony over the violence of your whole community. Mm -hmm. And therefore you need to, to change your behavior in order to make yourselves seem safe. Right. But of course, there is a violence in that because we live with that trauma all the time. You know, even when we think about some of the jokes that we make now, the black humor that we've developed within the context of the war on terror, using terms like, oh, you're such an extremist or you're such a, you know, you know, don't say that out loud or pretend like, 
you know, MI5 is listening into your conversation. We, a lot of kind of, you know, Muslims do this now within the context of the war on terror. They, they do it as a joke, but there is something that's real behind it, which is this palpable sense that we feel that we are under constant scrutiny. Terrorism experts like, like Mark Sageman, what do they tell us about this, this moment? They tell us that, you know, his book, Misunderstanding Terrorism, which is, is a very good book, um, I highly recommend, even though he's former CIA, but it's still a very good book. He describes that actually the reality of terrorism statistics is this, that currently for every one person who turns out to be a, a, a somebody involved with political violence, sorry, I don't really like to use the term terrorist, I prefer political violence, there are 999,999 individuals who are arrested, detained, or suspected in some shape, form, or manner. That means they're getting it wrong one out of uh, 999,999 out of every million times. We are suffering the consequence of that, and we have to acknowledge that that is the case, that, th that we have allowed, especially for liberals to say, when they, when they say the argument that we need these laws this is a price that we have to pay. The only people that are pay paying that price are largely Muslims and those who are considered to be seditious to the state. Because now we see, for example, in the UK, environmental activists having terrorism laws being used against them. So anyone who's considered even slightly seditious to, to, the, to the power and the hegemony of the state, especially towards neoliberalism, they are then brought into the rubric of being seditious and therefore within the rubric of terrorism. And so... You know, ultimately, what are, what are we um, talking about here? These laws, in the way that they are constructed, they have a chilling effect, a chilling effect on our, on our, uh, on our speech, on our lives, on our behaviours, and a chilling effect that ultimately brings in its own trauma, a trauma that we really cannot understand its full consequences in the now. We will only really start to see the consequences of this in the way that it exists, probably 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And, uh, you know, I don't even know what, what that will look like, but it's important that we, we arrest uh, these practices in the war on terror uh, as soon as possible in order to stop that long-term trauma from taking root. So I'm going to stop here now uh, and hopefully open up more time for, for Q&A. Thank you so much, Asim. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we, especially within the liberal activist realm as, as all of you have brought up um, forget is the human impact of, of, of um, detainment and what that does to families and you said you know in your presentation all people involved in detainment are changed forever throughout a variety of aspects um, from their children to their families to the intergenerational traumas and the generations that will come after them, and we've seen this, you know, and and what colonialism has done to so many of our generations, um, you know, and I think it's it's such a key thing to remember as we continue in the in the Q and A part of this um, webinar, we are talking about human beings in each of these three represented um, situations. So I want to. We have about ten minutes um, for the Q and A, and so many of you have asked some pretty fantastic questions. So I thank you for that. Um, I want to give after the Q&A, the panelists just a, a few minutes just to wrap up and let you all know where you can follow them and follow their work. So we'll get to about two questions per panelist and then we'll close out. Um, so I apologize in advance if we are not able to get to your question, um, but you do have their contact on Twitter. Please uh, be kind and connect with them there. So I wanna start with you, um, Habil. There were a lot of questions that came in in regards to um, Kashmir and also the change um, from uh, before and after the repealing of Article 370. So one of the questions that came in was, how do you think that, how do you think the nature and frequency of detention, torture and arrest changed before and after the repealing of Article 370? Oh, you are on mute. I'm gonna try to unmute you. Can you try to unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, perfect. Uh, so uh, you want me to talk about what has changed uh, post uh, repealing of Article 370? Yes, and if you could also, just for those who don't know what Article 370 is, if there's uh, if there are viewers that are unfamiliar with the situation in Kashmir, if you could just briefly say what Article 3, 370 was. 
So uh, briefly, uh, Article 370 uh, gave uh, quote and quote special status to the people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, on 5th of uh, last year, it was deoperationalized by the uh, government of India and it was deoperationalized unilater unilaterally. So they did not uh, consult the people of Jammu and Kashmir on that. But uh, the larger picture here remains the same that before uh, repealing of the Article 370, it has always been the, I mean, military occupation here. So even after the repealing of the act, whatever little autonomy uh, the Kashmir region, the Jammu and Kashmir region had, it was repealed. So basically the attempt is to change the demographics and if any possible solution to the Kashmir conflict arises in the future, so once you change the demographics of the of the region, so then you can uh, alter, you know, what you want, how the results are going to be. So that is their basic uh, motive behind the repealment, behind the deoperationalizing of Article 370. Uh, and uh, in cases of changes, uh, the change can be uh, from what I told you, change in the demographics that uh, outsiders who are who could not buy land in uh, Jammu and Kashmir previously, we can have, it's a project for settler colonialism. So we can say that, that just like in Palestine, we had settlers who took over it and then we are seeing how Osama elaborated everything about Palestine. So this, uh, this repealing of the act is seen as a beginning of the same settler colonialism in Kashmir. But uh, mind it, even before Article 370, if the military apparatus of Indian state had to take over any land, had to do anything, they would always do it under the garb of different acts. So in that sense, not much has changed. It has, uh, the, the, the repressive state has always been doing one tactic or the other. But now it, it, this, this has been seen as the last nail in the coffin. So whatever little autonomy the region was enjoying, it has been stripped of that very unilaterally. And it has been followed by mass arrests Internet still, when I'm talking to you, we are still on 2G. So internet what was restored after months. There have been so many atrocities that, yeah, it's very difficult to talk about all that at length here. But yeah, briefly, uh, I think I summed it. Yes, thank you so very much. Habil. Um, another question that came through. Uh, in regards to Article 370 and, and 35A, and especially in regards to the International Criminal Court is um, two part question. One, is there a, a case for India to take um, to the ICC as Burma had done in the past? And then additionally, um, with the reference to the revocation of Article 370 and 35A, the Indian constitution showed it as temporary provisions with respect to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Did that mean they could revoke it at any time when, de when desired or was it subject to referendum? Uh, see, I would say uh, when we use these uh, technicalities of temporary provisions, we are resorting to legal sophistry and mm -hmm. nothing more than that. So uh, it, the case was pending in the Supreme Court of India. And uh, when the government decided to bring in an ordinance, it, show, it undermined its own Supreme Court. So on that context, I mean, but this has been happening here all along that how the, the role of the judiciary, we can talk about that maybe some other time, how the judiciary has, has behaved like an extended arm of the executive. So that's why we have come to uh, this position now wherein the people of Jammu and Kashmir have uh, little hope in the last refuge of the institution of justice, that is the courts, uh, that's regarding Article 370. And now what can we do, the people of Jammu and Kashmir, regarding can we take our cases to the international forums? Uh, we have uh, of late there has been uh, like two at, there have been two UN reports on uh, the atrocities in Jammu and Kashmir in 2018 to 2019. So th there has been an international pressure has been building up, 
but uh, again lot more needs to be done and uh, approaching uh, international uh, criminal courts some of uh, we have very uh, the procedural limits and then we know the executive machinery of imposing the international laws is not so great so i think uh, we the, the better choice would be uh, to highlight uh, it more at an international level mm -hmm. to build uh, international pressure international public opinion uh, to show to the world what india is doing in jammu and kashmir and that that will be more effective than uh, than uh, taking to the courts where we where we will face procedural difficulties it will be time consuming so uh, my my in my humble opinion uh, this like this collaborative effort we, we we are witnessing here this can be one beginning where we can bring solidarity where we can uh, bring groups across the cutting across uh, nations and solidarity networks can be made so i think these efforts can be made uh, which can really highlight uh, what we are witnessing in jammu and kashmir and how the international community can pressurize india to to have some confidence building measures here like uh, this is the mo we have uh, seven security we have seven security uh, se one civilian has seven security personnel so this is like uh, they should at least begin with demilitarizing and revoking some of these draconian uh, laws and then maybe sit on the dialogue table with pakistan and people of jammu and kashmir and settle this once for all thank you so much havil um osama two questions for you um there have been a few that have come in so i'm going to try to pack them in into into two questions um in terms of um in terms of palestine um the the one of the questions that that came in was remedies through courts of laws Uh, through courts of laws in the ICC and other places like the UN almost seem impossible at this point do you think political movements and mass resistance have helped or are helping to some extent so far um yes i i think so i think they've really um at least in the in in the sense of the international stage or the or, or the the sphere of publicity I think mass based uh, mass based movements um resistance in terms of even something as small as as advancing the language we've seen a huge uh, shift in the kind of language used to describe the Israeli occupation used to describe the affairs in Palestine even within the United States um and I think with that being said I think um it's also not sort of a legitimization of these structures if somebody if if people deem it necessary to pursue kind of um relief through the official legal mechanisms right like going to um like palestinians who have who have gone to the israeli prison services or gone to the israeli supreme court um just as a contrast to mass based structures and resistance and uh, you know requested through legal means um um you know reducing the sentence or at least charging the palestinian who they've been detaining for for who knows how long i think um those those approaches actually serve to sort of um expose even more so the israeli uh uh the israeli insistence on violating international law and human rights um and one last point i think on this idea of I, and I don't know if the question was referring to mass based movements just in Palestine I was kind of thinking of it as, as in, in reference to the global solidarity movement um even within the US as I said before you know no I, there was a point at which no one could have said you know like 10 years ago or be, uh, more than 10 years ago that Israel is an apartheid state the kind of shutdown the kind of censorship which still goes on um but was so severe that it was it was unthinkable um and now it's not unthinkable to be able to as a student organizer get on campus and and push for you know a bds resolution or to call israel an apartheid state so i think at least in terms of language yes in terms of actually alleviating the material conditions in palestine no um you know it it final point is that 
for when the uh, International Criminal Court in 2004, I believe, released their advisory opinion saying that the apartheid wall in Palestine was, uh, they deemed it illegal. Um, I mean, it's still there, right? So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult conversation um, in terms of how to balance these approaches. Thank you so much, Osama. And then another question, these are kind of, this is kind of three questions in one, so I apologize if it's, okay. I'm uh, trying to pack it right. in. Um, it has to do around COVID and also curfew um, for Palestinians. So how do Palestinians survive during indefinite curfew? How are they impacted? And um, what do you see as the impact of, of um, coping or can they cope with COVID-19? Um, and how are prisoners, what is the response to um, prisons and, and COVID in Palestine? Um, okay, so I think I'll take the approach of answering the curfew question uh, and then kind of getting into COVID-19. Um, I think, um, so as, as I also read the question as it popped up, uh, it was saying, how do Palestinians manage to basically exist with these curfews basically in place, uh, indefinite all the time? I think it's important to mention uh, the circumstances differ in Palestine depending on which area you're in. And even depending on which area you're in, there's areas A, B, and C set up by the Oslo Accords through 1993 to 1995 through the process of actually uh, institutionalizing Oslo. Um, area A being under you know, full supposed Palestinian authority control, uh, which is kind of the neo-colonial body set up uh, in conjunction with the Palestinian elites and the Israeli um, occupation, have full control of Area A, supposedly. Area B was, was envisioned to be joint Israeli-Palestinian control. And Area C, which actually takes up the majority of the West Bank is under complete uh, hegemony of the occupation. So in areas A, I mean, sometimes you don't have a curfew depending on where you are in area A. I'm from a village uh, that is actually in area A, but despite not, um, despite being in area A, quite often we will have, uh, when, I'm when I'm visiting my family overseas, you will have random night raids that happen and you can, clear them you can see them clearly, even though we are supposed to be in the, the, the great Bantu stand that is area A. In area B, um, similarly, you're supposed to have Palestinian authority civil control, yet Israel can invade whenever they want. And then um, in area C, you have curfews and also the threat of, of many homes and villages being demolished. Um, and in all of these areas, you can have random curfews imposed at all times, regardless of which area um, you're in, regardless of pa supposed Palestinian authority area of control. Uh, when these curfews are instituted, I mean, Palestinians through movement building, through their networks, um, through grouping together, they, they, they attempt to maneuver around Israeli restrictions on, on Palestinian movement. Um, and, COVID-19, correct. Um, so one thing about, generally speaking, the Zionist the, within the prisons and also within, I mean, th this is again, like the connection between the prisons and, and, the, and the Palestinian street. It is a policy that is part and parcel to the Zionist occupation to um, push for medical negligence within Palestine in that, in that um, the Israeli occupation has essentially deteriorated um, every precondition for public health in Palestine. Um, but if we focus on the, on the case of the prisoners, um, there, there was an example of, of, of Nur al-Barghudi, who was a 23-year-old Palestinian imprisoned for his resistance against the Zionist settler occupation. About last week, he died um, after losing consciousness in an Israeli jail. According to the Palestinian um, prisoner society and the movement, the prison guard neglected to act quickly, waited more than half an hour before, before providing medical treatment, and he fell as a martyr. And there's many different examples of this. Um, so with COVID-19, um, especially, we've had Palestinian prisoners um, been infected by COVID-19 uh, coronavirus, 
um, introduced by an Israeli interrogation officer. Um, and while prisoners are supposed to be in quarantine because of this outbreak within the prisons, the Israeli prison officers continue to conduct daily searches of their cells without wearing PPE, proper protective equipment. So there's this complete disregard of prisoner safety and health. Um, and medical negligence is a, is a reoccurring policy um, that um, Israeli prison services have routinely used. And I, and I believe three Palestinians have fell martyr already due to COVID-19 within the prisons. Uh, I hope that answered every facet of the question. Thank you so much, Osama. Um, Asim, two more questions for you and then we're gonna wrap up uh, the webinar and thank you everybody for asking your questions. I know we haven't been able to get to all of them. Um, Asim, one of the, uh, the questions, this question came through on Zoom. How can we influence the international community to realize that families and friends of prisoners um, are victims uh, as well? Um, this, uh, the questioner gives an example of a sister of a physically and mentally tortured detainee for 120 days stating over and over through those 120 days that she feels like she is, she is the one who is being prisoned and uh, tortured and the effects are unbelievably real. Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think this is the uh, one of the hardest questions to answer because we haven't reached a situation where prisoners themselves are seen as human beings yet. Um, and so, you know, trying to extend that understanding of care and concern beyond them, you know, that seems like a, 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 a dream from, from a, another reality, maybe, because, the, I mean, like I was saying in my presentation, the biggest problem that we have really is um, the extent to which those who are supposed to be our allies are constantly telling us that this is a price that we all have to pay. And, and I guess one of the, the, the things that I've been trying to do in my work is trying to, uh, especially maybe in some of my more philosophical work, trying to think about what complicity means in, in these structures of extreme violence that we're all subject to. So, you know, ultimately, you know, those of us who are at most risk at the highest end of being subject to that violence, we are actually the least complicit. You know, the detainee themselves, the families of the detainee, in the, in the, in the system and the structure, we have to understand that they have zero agency. All they want is their life back or some meaning of, of, of a, a life that is li well lived and well fulfilled, right? And so there is no judgment upon them for trying to use the system. And, you know, as Habib mentioned himself already, that the, the, the law itself is part of the violence of the system. And so we, you know, they are the least complicit. But as we move away from the individual, their family that's impacted, then it's the community. The community suffers the violence as well. It sees the violence, it suffers the violence. It becomes scared. There's a less of a complicity there, okay? By the time we get to the liberal media, the liberal NGOs, the amnesties that Osama mentioned, they should be the ones taking the most risks at holding the structures of violence to account. And, you know, this is something that I've been very, very forceful on in my work, that you know, those who suffer at the hardest end of the violence are definitely the least complicit in the system. Their use of the system does not indicate that they think that the system is okay, as the liberals tell us. Liberals want to t give us the idea that building in human rights safeguards into racist structures somehow is okay. It's not okay. The structure is still racist. Providing uh, adequate blankets and pillows does not mean that our oppression is okay. It's like... Um, I was stopped recently coming back into the into the UK. I mean, I'm a citizen of the country, but we have a law here under the Terrorism Act that allows you to be detained. You have to answer their questions by law. Uh, and if you don't, uh, they can charge you with a terrorism offense for refusing to do so. OK, and this is a suspicionless stop. So it's just a profiling stop. So at one point, halfway through, they asked me, you know, uh, you know you're, you're a practice Muslim. Would you would you would you like to pray? And I refused because I'm not going to let anybody make 
them feel like their racist profiling is somehow, you know, that I'm going to make them feel better about it. I just want to be done with this. Even if I pray late, I'd rather that than for you to feel better about yourself, about what you're putting me through. Okay. And I think that's, that this is one of the key things here that, you know, in our activism, in, in the work that we're doing, in our campaigning, we don't shoot for small goals. Okay. That's extremely important that, you know, the idea that we just give up our rights because it's politically the right thing to do. We need to stop with all of that. You know, that's where we are well past the point of um, reasoning our way out of this. Okay. And so we need to be holding, especially those who claim to fight in our name, those organizations that the liberal organizations that claim to be, you know, fighting for Palestinian rights, for Kashmiri rights, uh, against Islamophobia. We need to be saying to them that actually you guys need to be taking more risks in what you're doing because you are at the least violent end of the spectrum and therefore you the, the risk taking should be highest at your end. So I hope that goes some way to answer the question, even if it's more philosophical. I think that was an excellent um, answer and it is so true. This is something that we all need to keep in mind that we have to keep the bigger picture in mind. It is not about the small wins. Um, the, the second question that I want to ask you actually came in via email. Um, uh, and um, each of the contexts that you are referring to or that you refer to rely on the, uh, rely on the logic of terrorism to incarcerate people. How do you attempt to challenge that or how are you challenging that? And how can we build or still build meaningful solidarity amongst a broader group of people and institutions given what the bogey of terrorism can do? Sure, thank you. That's a really, really great question. Um, so here's an interesting fact about the UK. And I mean, you, actually I'm more familiar with the US than I am the UK, but you know, both contexts are, are, are similar in many respects. You do not get, if you commit an act of political violence in the, in the UK, you don't get charged for terrorism offences. Okay, so if you commit an actual act of violence, you get charged under the criminal justice system, under the Foreign Explosives Act, if there's an element of a, a bomb or a fire, or under the Offences Against Persons Act, but you won't get charged or convicted under terrorism laws. Terrorism laws kick in when there's no violence, okay? Because it's part of a structure of, of racism and, and pathologizing that we have. And that is where the actual violence takes place. Right. And so by challenge, we have to challenge exactly what terrorism is and what terrorism convictions are, because nearly always they are for things that have nothing to do with actual violence. We, we, you know, we all want safe societies. We all want societies that are free of violence. But when people are getting arrested for reading the wrong book, then that is a problem. I mean, I'll give you an example of a case of a young woman named Roxana Begum. Her brothers were convicted of terrorism offenses they pled guilty even their guilty plea was somewhat suspicious because the they were willing to fight it and on the day the morning of the trial the prosecution came to them and said you know we uh you know we we believe that there is evidence that your mother and your sisters were uh were somehow uh, blocking uh, our investigation and therefore we're gonna we're thinking about prosecuting them too as well and you know like most people in our cultures the next thing you do is you sign whatever document it is that they want you to sign, right? So there were very, very suspicious uh, aspects to them pleading guilty before the trial even began, even though they had prepped for the trial. But anyway, Roxana herself, she had started reading some of the material that was as part of the defense strategy, and she kept, she had, she had this on her, on a USB stick. Now, if you read certain types of magazines, um, let's just say that, you know, kind of more on the militant end, for example, like the anarchist cookbook or, or whatever, then that technically is a strict liability offense. There is no longer any uh, presumption of innocence. By having that material in your possession, you have committed the offense. It is now upon you to prove that you had a reasonable excuse for having it. So in the end, her lawyer tells her to plead guilty. He says, look, no jury is going to see you uh, in a good light because your brothers uh, pled guilty as well. Uh, they're probably going to come down quite hard on you. It's better that you plead guilty. In her sentencing by the judge, the judge says to her, these are pretty much his words. Okay, you can, you can find the case online. He says, you're a good person. You had a great 
uh, career ahead of you. You're on a good track in life. I do not believe that you had any involvement or any intention to be involved with, with, with terrorism. But because you pled guilty, I have to sentence, uh, sentence you. And because I'm a bit unsure about your personal views that you might have on the inside, I'm going to sentence you to a year in prison so that you can go through mandatory de-radicalization. He's already recognized that there's no issue here with her, that she, there's nothing about her life that indicates that she has any desire to be involved in terrorism whatsoever and any acts of political violence. But yet he still gives her a year in prison. And then while she's in prison, she has to go through all these assessments and they ask her questions like, what do you think of these you know, kind of far right groups? Well, she says, oh, if you're gonna ban Muslims, certain Muslim groups, then you should ban these groups as well. And they would like label her down as having an us versus them mentality. So all of this, all of this is a pathologizing. The way that these systems and structures are, are built, especially when it comes to people of color, is that they take cultural markers about who we are and, you know, and what our lives are like. And then they, they produce these laws that are, are geared towards producing the results that we see. So when people talk about there are this many people, you know, convicted of terrorism in the UK, that statistic is absolute nonsense because the number of people who are actually involved in violence is negligible in that group. You know, my own colleague, Mohammed Rabani, we, we were in, uh, sorry, I'll try and finish this up very quickly, but we were in, in the Middle East together interviewing a man who had for 13 years been tortured and abused by the FBI. And we were implicating a very high profile FBI agent. His name's Ali Soufan uh, in this case. And all of this was very, very secret at the time we were doing the investigation. So when he, I had to go off to another country to do some more work, but he came back to the UK. When he was came back to the UK under the same legislation I told you about before, he stopped. They asked for the passwords to his devices, and he had some of the client confidential information on his devices. He says, "I can't give it to you. I can't give you my device because I have client confidential information, and if I do, then I would be I would be in breach of that." They said, look, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna charge you with an offense, with a terrorism offense, if you don't give us your devices. He said, I can't. It's my ethical duty to maintain the integrity of my, my client's information. So they charged him, and he was convicted as a terrorist for refusing to hand over his passwords. And this is in the UK, of course. You know, we're, not, you know, we're not talking about you know, kind of some kind of uh, so-called despotic regime. But the, this is the thing about the, the globalization of the war on terror. This is why I come back to Angela Davis's you know, statement that all of this militarization connects you know these practices and these policies together we we cannot see them as distinct from one another yes of course they look slightly different in in what they pathologize maybe you know like for example now we have terrorism laws being used to pathologize black so-called black gangs over the types of music they listen to so that's used in a matrix of counterterrorism that they have specifically for black gangs so Everyone gets pathologized in different ways, but the architecture is ultimately the same. Thank you so much, Asim. Um, I, I want to take a moment, and I know, I mean, we could keep on this discussion going for a very long time. And um, I, I suspect that we will probably have another webinar in uh, the very near future with, with our panelists again, because there is so much still to unpack. Um, so with that, I just want to, um, Habil Osama and Asim, if you can just give a brief, brief um, where people can find you and uh, how they can follow your work, that would be great. Um, Habil, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, <clears throat> well, as I said, uh, as you also mentioned that we are on Twitter, so people can follow there and then we can exchange maybe email IDs with individuals who want to reach to us. And about the work, uh, I would urge here people to please talk about Release Kashmiri Prisoners campaign. It's uh, on their website also. Individuals as well as organizations can both uh, do their bit. They can uh, learn more about this uh, campaign. And uh, yes, uh, I feel this is a great uh, beginning here and we should have more such webinars and collaborative uh, efforts in the future also, even when COVID is gone. Thank you so much, Havil. Um, Osama, turning it over to you. Um, yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to say um, 
Uh, thank you, Habil, and thank you, Asim. I've, I've learned so much. I have a lot of reading to do and um, feel very enlightened by the, by the uh, uh, session we've had. Um, I, I kind of want to just mention really briefly, um, uh, when you were speaking, Asim, about the situation in the UK and, and, and the line that you said that the um, terrorism charges come into play when there is no violence. Um, there was a very historic case here, and, and, and I'm sure you may be familiar with it, but the Holy Land Foundation. Um, it's a very significant case in the history of surveillance and imprisonment of Palestinian Muslims uh, in the era of the war on terror. Um, for the sake of time, I can't get into it. Um, Palestinian Youth Movement, PYMUSA.com. So PYMUSA.com, you can read the statements um, and information and analysis that the Palestinian Youth Movement sets up. Um, there is a there is a statement released on the Holy Land Foundation that kind of speaks to it. Uh, it was without a doubt probably it, it it just had a huge chilling effect on Muslim and the Arab communities in the U.S. and on and on Muslim and Palestinian organizing in particular. Um, I'd also like to highlight Samidun.net. Uh, Samidun.net um, is the Palestinian. Uh, it, it's a solidarity network for um, Palestinian prisoners advancing their struggle, advancing their cause. Um, Samidu.net, uh, there's a lot of campaigns that they conduct um, and their analysis is one that, that, I, that, I, that I also appreciate. Um, yeah. Sorry, thank I you thought, uh, Yes, sorry, Osama, thank you so much. I was unmuting myself. Asim, please. Yeah, thank you, Osama, I really appreciate you. Um, uh, mentioned the Holy Land Foundation case. I think there are so many Palestinian cases actually that we need to be thinking about in, especially in their nexus to the war on terror. Um, so yeah, you can follow my organization's work, um, CAGE. It's www.cage.ngo. Well, you know, all over Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, I have a, an account on Instagram called The Books Nest, which is really looking at kind of social justice readings um, over kind of a range of literature that you might be interested in too. Uh, so yeah, inshallah, if we can kind of stay connected with one another uh, across the range of these um, issues we've been discussing today. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Asim, Osama, and Habil. Um, thank you to everybody who has joined us for this webinar on Zoom and on YouTube. I apologize again if we didn't get to your questions, but we will be sending out follow-up information. If you are on Zoom, you will see that I've just put in um, the mailing list. So if you are not on the mailing list, please sign up there because that is where we send out um, the next coming webinars in the series um, and, and, uh, and further information. So um, sign up there. Please take care of yourselves. Um, to all of our Muslim brothers and sisters and siblings, Ramadan, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you and um, stay tuned for more in this webinar series. Thank you again to everyone and to Habil As Asim and you, Osama. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs>